сейчас с новостями. Подведем итоги сегодняшнего дня. ТВ Рей, дождь. The only Russia's independent network. We are not allowed to work in our country anymore. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you. It's a real war. Maybe there are some negotiations about that. There will be very serious consequences. TV Rain Newsroom presents Russia Tomorrow. Hi everyone, this is Tikhon Zitko and this is Russia Tomorrow, where we look at the main news of the week that happens in, around and related to Russia. We are TV Rain, the last remaining Russian independent news channel. Shortly after the start of the war, we were forced to leave Russia under threat of persecution and are now broadcasting from abroad. But the mission has not changed. We continue to tell the truth about Russia, the truth that Vladimir Putin is afraid of. Make sure to support us on GoFundMe, like this video, subscribe and share this video on your socials. And in today's program. Failure at the front, the Ukrainian army continues a successful counteroffensive. Vladimir Putin under fire from his supporters due to failure in Ukraine. The European Union significantly limits visas issued to Russian citizens. This past weekend in Russia was simultaneously one of the strangest and liveliest in Russia in recent months. Moscow held its annual City Day to celebrate the anniversary of its founding, an occasion which Russian President Vladimir Putin marked by opening the Sun of Moscow, the tallest Ferris wheel in Europe, in the capital. It's pretty amazing. They don't have a 140-meter Ferris wheel in Europe. Incredible. Thank you very much for continuing to help recreation and entertainment thrive in Moscow. It's really important for everyone. Now, don't get us wrong. What's important isn't Putin's grand opening or the Ferris wheel. What is important is that he did this at a time when 750 kilometers from Moscow, his army was suffering its most embarrassing defeat in the past six months. Ukrainian troops launched a counteroffensive last week. In 10 days, they managed to take back control of almost the entire territory of the Kharkiv region, which makes up more than 300 settlements. Russian troops retreating abandoned their equipment and supplies. <laughs> And the few remaining local residents greeted the Ukrainian soldiers with applause. These videos completely go against the Kremlin's expectations in Ukraine. Moscow had presumed that its soldiers would be greeted in Ukraine with flowers, and Russian propagandists spread the myth that the Ukrainian army wouldn't be able to resist Russian forces for even a week. Понимали, что в горячей войне мы Украину победим за два дня. Чего ее побеждать-то, господи, ну Украина, подавили эти огневые точки, вот мы в рекламную паузу это обсуждали. In reality, Russia is facing a major defeat in the east of Ukraine, and Russian propagandists cannot hide their disappointment about it. They demand more ruthlessness from the Russian government. Let's take a look. Американская стратегия ведения войны подразумевает уничтожение инфраструктуры, в том числе гражданской. Это часть натовской стратегии. Почему мы не хотим этого делать? По-моему, пора уже жестить. This is an excerpt from the program Evening with Vladimir Solovyov, which aired on September 11th. One of the main faces of state propaganda believes that it's time to be more ruthless. Margarita Simonyan agrees, as does her husband Tigran Kiyosayan. А на Украине, на оставшейся, на неосвобожденной, нет гражданской инфраструктуры? 
нету, там нет лэпов, АЭС там еще есть, правда, узлы, ну много разной всякой инфраструктуры, которая, в принципе, может вывести из строя функционирование этого враждебного нам государства, оставшегося, да, очень быстро, легко и надолго, ему будет уже не до этого. Это не энергоблок, а есть другие теплоэнергостанции, да, ну, есть. есть масса станций, там у них же есть еще и АЭС, понимаете? Я, вот именно да это. Потому что надо снести полностью, на мой взгляд, я не советую военным, я говорю о психологии. Всю банковую. Вот всю банковую с ней ничего. Мюнхен снесли, и потом по фотографиям восстановили. Если там есть здание, которое надо восстановить, мы восстановим. Так построим. At the same time, reports of blackouts in some regions of Ukraine first appear on social media. Soon Ukrainian authorities announced that vital infrastructure points have been the targets of shelling, including Tets 5 in Kharkiv. And because of this, the Kharkiv, Sumy, Donetsk, Dnepropetrovsk and Zaporizhia regions find themselves without energy sources. Pro Kremlin authors shared their joy on social media. Electricity is not a right, but a privilege. Keeping Ukraine in a constant blackout doesn't require much effort. After the first successes of the Ukrainian counteroffensive in the Kharkiv region, many telegram channels supporting the Z movement accused Russian leadership of incompetence and poor decision making. So what do you do when the government, in just three days, surrenders Russian lands that have been liberated with six months of painstaking work? Lands that Turchak promised would be Russian forever, and where as recently as September 6th they were issuing Russian passports. What's happening, just like for all true patriots, only fills me with rage. Even the leader of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, suggested that the Russian Ministry of Defense had made mistakes and promised to take the situation into his own hands. If there isn't a change in strategy in the special military operation either today or tomorrow, I'll be forced to confront the Ministry of Defense and the leaders of the country and really explain to them the situation that's happening on the ground. It's a really interesting situation, a crazy situation. There are really even advantages to retreating and relinquishing some towns and villages. He also extended an invitation to Russian military journalists to discuss the situation and carefully discuss what really defines patriotism. But that's not all. There is pressure from the parliament too. The leader of the Russian communists who advocate for the restoration of the Soviet Union, with Ukraine included, of course, is calling for the draft to be introduced in Russia. How is a special military operation different from a war? You can stop the military operation at any moment, but a war you cannot stop. It ends either in victory or defeat. That is to say, there's a war going on and we cannot afford to lose it. We can't panic now. We need to mobilize the country in its entirety and enact completely different laws. But the Russian authorities are not ready to introduce a draft yet. Experts suggest that this would lead to a huge increase in social unrest. After all, those in power prepared everyone for a small military operation, not a full-scale war. The Kremlin has therefore found itself under fire from multiple directions. It has been decided to address the deputies of the State Duma with a proposal to take action against the President of the Russian Federation and remove him from office. The authors of this message call themselves patriots, and even they are unhappy with Putin opening the Ferris wheel during the collapse of the Russian army at the front. With its military failures, the Kremlin is turning those who were previously its main allies against itself. It is against this backdrop that the Kremlin is increasing the pressure on those who oppose the war. Dozens of Russian deputies from 18 municipalities wrote a letter to Vladimir Putin calling for his resignation as a result of the war in Ukraine. Some of them were then called into the police, but they refused to abandon their position. We decided to try and address Putin's audience using Putin's arguments. He believes that NATO's expansion to the east is a threat to Russia. Well, okay. As a result of his decision on February 24th, the border between Russia and NATO member nations has increased more than twofold, which we wrote in the address. He believes that the main goal of his decision on the 24th of February is the demilitarization of Ukraine. But instead, Ukraine has received military aid in the form of weapons and equipment totaling $38 billion. Even more, Russian soldiers are dying and it's no secret that the Russian economy is suffering. I think that Putin's audience will be able to at least stop and consider these arguments. Russia tomorrow.
You might recall that last week we talked about Russian politician Leonid Gozman, who was imprisoned for 15 days for just comparing the USSR to Nazi Germany. On Tuesday, he was released. Immediately after that, he was arrested again and imprisoned for 15 days again on the same exact charges. The risk of a criminal case is always there for those who hold some sort of active position. But at the moment, there's specifically an administrative protocol being drawn up. Alexei Navalny, the leader of the Russian opposition, has been in prison for over 600 days. In the past few weeks, he has additionally been placed in a solitary confinement cell, a cell with incredibly strict and difficult conditions several times. You can see the effects of that here on the picture. The reason for this is very clear. It is an intimidation tactic. But is it really effective? And what do ordinary people really think about what is happening? Grigory Yudin, philosopher and sociologist, is joining me now. So, so Grigory, thank you so much for joining us here. How significant can the defeat in the Kharkiv region be for Vladimir Putin? Will it affect his level of support? Um, hi, thanks for, for having me. Uh, well, I think uh, it uh, can be significant in dealing with uh, part of, uh, of Russian population, uh, a significant group consisting of uh, radicals who are vehemently uh, supporting this war, really engaged in this war. Uh, since they've been following uh, the events at the front lines, they are already, of course, aware of uh, the setbacks, uh, and uh, they get angry at political leadership, and more generally, they get angry at the lack of political and military mobilization. So they are now pressing for uh, more and more mobilization. And since Putin's strategy uh, relies on uh, general demobilization of the population, the preservation of uh, life as usual, uh, but at the same time uh, mobilizing part of, uh, of the population. Uh, I think he, uh, he is now under increasing uh, pressure uh, due to these setbacks. Mm -hmm. But let's, let's try to imagine what could be the consequences of uh, the fact that these radicals, that they are angry at him. Uh, well, it just shows that uh, the the strategy that uh, he is using, once again, is a strategy of general demobilization and mobilization of one part only. It is tenable only as long as the situation in the front lines uh, is more or less positive. Uh, with uh, those defeats, and probably we're going to see more of them, there is a conflict between these uh, two big segments of the population. The very uh, loud uh, minority and the passive uh, majority. And at some point, Putin will have to make a decision whether to uh, call for general mobilization or uh, to turn uh, on, these, uh, on these radicals. So at some point, he will need to deal with them. Speaking of these uh, radicals and speaking of this uh, passive part of the uh, population uh, at the beginning of the war back in uh, February or March, you you said that the war was being supported by this aggressive minority, which you've just uh, mentioned, that there was about a quarter of the population against the war and that the majority of the population was passive. Now, to what extent has this balance been maintained now, six months after the beginning of the war? And can we predict which side this passive majority might lean towards? Well, I don't think there's been a significant change uh, in, in, this, uh, in this ratio. I don't think we uh, hear of uh, much defections from uh, one group to the other, but it should be kept in mind that the distinctions are sometimes blurred, you know. Uh, when there is a more pressure for mobilization, some of the people who are normally passive would become a little bit more engaged, whereas when the pressure is decreasing, uh, they would become uh, more uh, abstained. So I don't think there is uh, much much of a uh, shift here, but with the possible defeat, there will uh, definitely be a reshuffling of this, uh, you know, tripartite uh, structure of Russian society. There is a lot of talks and a lot of questions. What could 
wake this uh, passive majority up? Do you have the, the answer to this question? Well, I think uh, Putin still has a trump card uh, of uh, serious political mobilization because the society is generally atomized, it is passive, and if it is scared enough, it is pressured enough, I think we could see a sort of uh, terror uh, unleashed uh, internally, possibly followed by uh, a military uh, mobilization. So this would be a sort of uh, a wake-up call. Otherwise, I think we should rather wait for um, some cracks in the system uh, emerging. And at that point, uh, we'll suddenly see parts of this uh, passive, uh, passive majority defecting to the dissenters, to those who no longer see war as a, a feasible way for Russian Federation to continue. My last question, and I know that you've answered many times to this question, but still, uh, nevertheless, uh, all the polls published in Russia show, and I would say, overwhelming support, uh, overwhelming uh, majority supporting the so-called special military operation. I know that you think that these polls could not be trusted, so my my, my question is uh, why they, they could not be trusted, why we should not trust these polls? Well, for a number of reasons. First of all, we always have to keep in mind that there is only a tiny minority uh, who can be reached through, through these polls. It depends on, on the methodology, but it's somewhere between 7, 15, maybe sometimes 20 percent, and there are multiple reports, even though they are contested, that uh, during the wartime, the percentage uh, of those who can be reached, the so-called response rate, uh, got even lower. Uh, so this is, this is issue number one. Now, issue number two is, of course, the way people perceive those questions, because uh, normally uh, the, uh, the audience would look at those direct questions, like, do you support the operation? Do you support the president? Do you support the politicians? And those questions during the wartime are uh, comprehended uh, by, by the respondents as a loyalty test. Uh, and of course, in this, uh, during the wartime, a failing of a loyalty test might be dangerous. I mean, technically, you can end up uh, behind bars for 15 years in, in Russia. And this is an explanation why not only the level of support for military operation, but also the level of support for all major politicians, mm -hmm. including Vladimir Zhirinovsky, went up in March and April when Zhirinovsky was already dead. Hmm. So this is a sort of what uh, the uh, scholars would call yes, yes saying. Uh, and there are also many additional effects that make those direct questions almost useless in, um, well, if we think of that as a sort of a referendum, uh, that definitely cannot fu function as, a, as an ersatz for a referendum on whether people support the war. Russia tomorrow. The European Union has cancelled the simplified visa regime with the Russian Federation. This means that now it will be more difficult and expensive for Russian citizens to obtain a Schengen visa. Applications for these visas will take longer to process and will only be issued for a short period of time. This is a compromise. After all, a number of European countries proposed to deprive Russians of the right to enter the European Union altogether. Indeed, the Baltic countries and Poland will introduce such a norm from September 19th. One way or another, Russians will now be able to travel to Europe much less frequently in response to the war Putin is waging in Ukraine. But will it make anyone feel better? For more on this, my colleague Ekaterina Katrikadze. The states of Eastern Europe are the harshest on the Russians, and this is understandable. The difficult experience of Soviet occupation has convinced the Baltic states and Poland that Russia is an empire of evil. In principle, you don't have to stretch your imagination to come to this conclusion. Let me remind you that in September 1939, the USSR invaded Poland. A month before that, Moscow had signed with Nazi Germany a non-aggression pact and a treaty regarding allyship. 
citizenship and borders with secret protocols embedded within. According to these protocols, Finland, Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia were defined as spheres of interest of the USSR. And in 1940, the annexation, or as Kremlin liked to say, the joining of territories was carried out against their will. The actions of the Russian army in Ukraine painfully remind the people of Eastern Europe of their history. For a huge number of families here in Latvia, stories about the crimes of the Soviet regime are passed down from generation to generation. And all of this is to be borne in mind when considering the reaction of Russia's neighbors to the current crisis. Stop issuing tourist visas to Russians. Visiting Europe is a privilege, not a human right. Air travel from Russia is shut down. It means while Schengen countries issue visas, neighbors to Russia carry the burden. Finland, Estonia, Latvia, sole access points. Time to end tourism from Russia now. The head of the Estonian government, Kai Kalas, was the first to say that visiting Europe is a privilege, not a human right. European politicians and officials have echoed her words one after another. Against the backdrop of Russia's catastrophic war in Ukraine and the history of Russian and Soviet crimes in all the places they were able to reach, the temptation to punish all holders of Russian passports can be perhaps regarded as something natural as the last drop of patience ran out. I myself am well aware of this temptation as a Georgian who watched the Russian invasion, saw the death of a close friend, journalist in Tinvali, South Ossetia, and experienced absolute horror at the enemy army around the corner. And yet, we must be better. Better than those who label and stereotype entire nation. After all, this is how we differ from the conditional deputy of Russian parliament, Pyotr Tolstoy. Our relationship with these countries are ruined for decades into the future, not just for a couple of months. People say that we'll get over it, we'll get in through Turkey. None of that is going to happen. We need to understand the depths of the Russophobia here. They hate us just because we're different. They tried to teach us about their democracy for 30 years. They didn't try that in China because they look different. Or the editor-in-chief of Russia Today, Margarita Simonyan. In Europe, honestly, Russians are undoubtedly the new Jews. No one can deny it. Just because of our national characteristics, because of where we were born, we are branded as outcasts and pariahs and are being flooded with sanctions, economic turmoil, hunger and anything else you can think of. They want to stop us from even existing. Or other faces of Russian propaganda. We, those who share the values of a liberal Western society, must remember any person is a person with rights. The Europeans taught us this. And now? Now, more and more often, we remember the Iron Curtain, the isolation of Soviet times, tens and hundreds of millions, second place, dreaming of worn-out genes, jazz and freedom, capturing the distant voices of another world on Soviet radio. Back then, it was our own government that wouldn't let us leave. Now the isolation of 140 million people is being seriously discussed by those who proved to the world that absolutely everybody does deserve respect and rights. Everyone deserves to live freely, to travel, to choose their own destiny, at least everyone who has not committed crimes. And a person's guilt or innocence before the law must be determined in accordance with legal norms. You can't just take a huge number of people and hand out a sentence on the principle of collective responsibility. In accordance with the new constitution, the greatest responsibility of those in power is to defend the rights and freedoms of all citizens and people. We may not have reached that point yet, but we will without a doubt. But now it turns out that everything has been set back zero, just like Putin's presidential term limits. If you were unlucky enough to be born in Russia, then too bad. You have no choice but suffer, even if you've spent your whole life dreaming about those European standards of democracy for your country. And to pay for the sins of your neighbor who supports either Putin or Stalin or Russian empire, as you know, there are lots of them. You will have to pay for those sins even if you went to rallies and were detained. If there's a record of your detention, then your chances of proving political persecution increase and they might take pity on you and grant you some kind of humanitarian visa as an exception. 
And if there is no record of detention, if you didn't sit in jail, did not speak on TV Rain, Dors, or radio station Echo of Moscow, how can you prove your dislike for Putin? They'll immediately think you're a tourist, and you will pay the price for that. There are several arguments for the cancellation of the entire Russian nation, with rare exceptions. Firstly, you cannot travel around as a tourist today when there is a bloody war going on in Ukraine arranged by your president. This is unethical. It is your president, after all. As if he was chosen in a fair, competitive election. As if the citizens of the Russian Federation had any choice. Opposition leaders are sitting in jail. Another opposition leader was murdered. There is no active political life in Russia. At the same time, I fully understand those who only see Russian citizens in expensive resorts, in T-shirts with USSR inscriptions. There are, of course, such people, but is everyone like that? And how can you distinguish decent people from despicable people? How do you identify those who live on a short-stay visa, but not just to party in Biarritz? We know that, after all, many asylum seekers do leave on tourist visas and then request new documents. Another argument is that if the Russian people have not overthrown Putin, then they should be all held responsible for these actions. Well, would you like to visit Russia and go out to demonstrate by yourself or gather in peaceful protest with like-minded people at the monument to Pushkin, for example, in the center of Moscow? Not really? Are you afraid of ending up in prison? Well, your suspicions would be well-founded. People in Russia tried to protest before the start of the war. And here's how it went. After each such demonstration, human rights activists counted hundreds and thousands of detainees across the country. Beatings have become a routine. This is what protests looked like in Russia. The next argument is that all Russians support this war and they should be all paying the price as a result. Ordinary Russian people didn't start the war, but at the same time we have to realize that they are supporting the war. I think it's not right that Russian citizens can travel into Europe's Schengen area, be tourists, see the sights while Russia is killing people in Ukraine. It's wrong. This is simply untrue. Even under the conditions of military censorship in Russia, there had been a noticeable trend towards a decrease in support for the so-called special military operation. One can split as about the figures, but the fact is that there is no convincing evidence that there is absolute approval of the war. Let's imagine that a family lives in Moscow, a family made up of people who categorically do not support what they're forced to call a special military operation. They have, for example, elderly parents who have refused to leave for six months. They do not go out to protest, but they go to restaurants, to the cinema and to water aerobics, for example. They take their children to playgrounds and on holidays continue to leave generally. Are they criminals? Are they accomplices? No, they are just people who need to raise their children, which does not negate the fact that their hearts break with horror and pain at the sight of the murdered children in Ukraine. How many such people are there in Russia? Let's suppose they manage to persuade their parents to leave, but then a strict representative of the European member state may announce to them that they've missed their chance that they should have overthrown Putin in time, or that they should have at least moved out in the first five months of the war. Another argument, they say that if all liberal Russians are returned and forced to remain in Russia, then they will have nowhere to go. They will immediately get organized and overthrow the dictator. Even if we say that only five or 10 percent of people in Russia were opposed to the war, then we would still be talking about millions and millions of people. Do you want these people to be outside Russia or inside? And what would your answer be? I still believe that change comes from within. And if we believe that a democratic Russia is possible in the future, it can only be established from inside. In fact, it might work in completely the opposite way. For those who are trapped in Russia might feel anger and instead object to those who have led them to being forcibly trapped there. If aggressive restrictions are adopted against ordinary Russians, most of them will unfortunately not blame Putin. 
the propagandists who have been lying for the last few years now about the frenzied Russophobia in the West will be victorious. They will scream out in chorus from every corner of the country. They simply hate Russians. They do. Talent may be far, but there are other capitals that are close. And would no one say that this is a fascist idea? It would also destroy the very idea of democracy, liberalism, freedom, and would virtually kill the zero-tolerance approach to xenophobia and nationalism. If they decide to go with it, it means they will also go with complete blind jinkoism. We've already commented on this provocative statement. We consider this an open declaration of intolerance and an affirmation of the thoughtless desire to wipe out anything that is Russian. Here, I deliberately do not quote from the appeals of Ukrainian officials to ostracize the Russians, to ban them, not to allow them to leave and to return them if they did leave. I will not break down Zelensky's statements since the beginning of the war and discuss how his rhetoric has changed. He is the president of the country which was attacked. After the war started, the speaker of the Russian parliament, Volodin, wrote with certainty that Zelensky had fled to Lviv. But he did not run away. He stayed and went out to the streets of Kyiv every day. He became a symbol of resistance to evil, united his nation into one powerful body and proved to the whole world that everything depends on the human spirit. This president may, maybe has the right to hate all Russians combined. Because it was in his country that more than 380 children were killed. It is he who looks into the eyes of parents and has to look over the fresh mass graves where his citizens, including civilians, are buried. That's his duty. Let's talk about Zelensky's political progression, his possible mistakes and controversial statements after this nightmare is over. Vladimir Putin viciously, senselessly and irrationally invaded Russia's neighboring state. Should the whole burden of responsibility now be borne by those who may not have enough strength, courage, determination and readiness to put the life and freedom of their families at risk in the fight against pure evil? Or those who privately helped civil activists, refugees from Ukraine, transferred money, donated clothes and food? Are all citizens of the Russian Federation at fault? Екатерина Катрикадзе, TV Rain Newsroom. Well, this has been Russia Tomorrow, a TV Rain show. We are producing this show in English to shine a light on what is really happening to us in Russia and how you can make an impact and support independent media in Russia by donating. Make sure to look at the link in the description down below. I'm Tikhon Zitko. I'll see you soon.